the world is changing fast. New technologies are impacting how we think about products, services, and the way we live our lives. Nowhere is this trend more present than in financial services, where new business models and customer expectations are changing our conceptions about banking, finance, and the very nature of money. Welcome to ReBank, a visionary podcast about banking, fintech, and the future. The future of banking is here. Hello and welcome to ReBank. I'm your host, Will Beeson. Today we're thrilled to be joined by Hussein Kanji, a London-based venture capitalist. Hussein co-runs Hoxton Ventures, a firm he started in 2013. Hussein is invested in and or served on the boards of some amazing companies, including Deliveroo, Babylon Health, Dark Trace, Behavox, and many more. Prior to starting Hoxton, Hussein worked on product at Microsoft and then at Excel, one of the world's premier venture firms. For all of our past episodes and to sign up to our newsletter, please visit bankingthefuture.com. Thank you very much for joining us today. Please welcome Hussein Kanji. Hussein Kanji, welcome to ReBank. Thanks for having me. I've been very much looking forward to this conversation. Um, you know, we generally go pretty deep on specific fintech related topics. Um, and f- fintech is fascinating. It's where I spend the majority of my time uh, as, a, as a practitioner, entrepreneur, and I suppose th- thinker more, more broadly. But, but fintech is nonetheless a, a, a subset of a you know, much broader uh, tech industry. Um, albeit with a financial services overlay. But I think there's a fascinating conversation to be had, not least because of all of the current you know, social and political challenges that you know, we're, we're kind of working through at a, at a global level um, and you know, r- rising power dominance of some leading technologies and some of the, the you know, early, um, early developers of those leading technologies. A fascinating conversation to be had about tech high level. Um, and I, I couldn't imagine a better person to have that conversation with than you. Uh, you're, in my experience, extremely reflective, and obviously a brilliant guy, but also with fascinating, uh, fascinating experience. I think you started your career at Microsoft after graduating from Stanford and eventually moved to the UK after an MBA, went to work at, at Excel, you know, one of the leading European uh, VCs. And then in 2013, closed your own fund and you've been investing since then can you just high level walk me through if there are any threads that kind of tie those experiences together as you look back over the course of your career yeah i mean venture was almost an accident um i did a bunch of startup stuff in between uh stanford and 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 microsoft and then i went from microsoft to to london uh so i'd moved up to seattle i didn't like the weather in seattle and then london kind of has similar enough weather and it's a global city which seattle is not unfortunately um, and i joined you know this this american fund that had opened up an office here and kind of learned the venture business um with them and then was pretty convinced that there was a big market gap in europe in kind of the early like the early part of this decade or or last decade and then set up like most younger people do uh was kind of frustrated and so set up my own shop uh to do that and then we started investing around that around that thesis that you know that the uk and europe would produce interesting companies and we'd be able to write the first check into those companies which has happened a few times and the market has since kind of filled in in a in a in a much more vibrant way there's a lot more stuff happening in the uk i was London and Partners, which is the mayor's kind of PR agency, publishes these reports every year on how much money comes into the UK and how much money comes into London in the tech industry. And it's gone from something like 100 million a year to like several billion a year, all in the last decade. So that that, that tells you the scale of the change uh, in the UK. And now I think the UK is the third largest unicorn producer in the world after the US and China which people 10 years ago wouldn't have ever believed. And to be fair, there's still enough people here who, you know, don't really understand and Mm. and are surprised by that fact. It doesn't, it doesn't really feel like that living here. 
No, not at all. But uh, but there are enough companies yeah. here, and some of those companies really do scale. So when you think about tech, you think about Israel. You might think about India. I was in Saudi uh, the day before yesterday, and I was at a dinner, and I mentioned this fact, and no one believed me. So I had to pull yeah. up my phone and kind of show that the data says like the the UK surpassed India. And you think of India as a tech as a tech economy, mm-hmm. but you don't think of the UK as a tech economy. And, and that's, I mean, you know, some come to mind. Like, TransferWise, Monzo, Revolut, you know, through my fintech lens, I, I'm sure like D- Deliveroo's and whole, whole slew in like the more consumer uh, tech space. Are, are these, you know, UK born, UK focused companies or are these you know, companies that started here like out of Oxford or Cambridge and then relocated to Boston or relocated to Silicon no, Valley? M- most of them are, are companies that are yeah. born here and usually maybe they might go other places, but they keep a good presence mm-hmm. here. Dark, Dark Trace would be an example that's mm-hmm. in our portfolio company. You know, 50% of its revenue comes from the U.S. or roughly roughly thereabouts it has I don't know, something like a thousand to fifteen hundred people all around the world, but it's still a London headquartered company with mm-hmm. a very Cambridge oriented engineering team. So yeah. uh, in terms of like from an ecosystem standpoint, maybe that's the starkest difference. Because if you if you go to the Bay Area, like it, it just you can tell that you're in a you know tech startup unicorn centric place. Here it doesn't feel that way. I don't know. Is it because it's a bigger city? Is it because uh, there's something different about like reinvestment of those proceeds back into the ecosystem? Is there something different about equity ownership and incentivization that means that early stage employees like don't earn out in the same ways? Yeah, well, I think the Bay Area is pretty unique and, and maybe Israel might kind of be unique because it's a small country in, in the same way. The Bay Area is a single industry town. Uh, you know, I had a friend who's a professor of medicine at Stanford, which is like no small feat. I mean, that's a that's a very high that's a very high pedigree type job. And and she feels like a failure because she hasn't built her own company. Um, you know, so imagine this, like someone who goes through the medical school system and ends up becoming a tenured professor does feels like they've underachieved because their friends have all built companies and that's the bar and that just tells you how much of a single industry town you know the bay area is um everyone measures themselves based on how they do on the company creation side Mm. london isn't that uh i would argue new york isn't that either um but there's a lot more stuff in london than most people kind of understand Mm. historically people associate london with kind of maybe finance and might you know affiliated with like kind of advertising uh architecture but you know, there's a there's a tech industry that's kind of grown up, and we're still in the early innings of that tech industry. So it's only really happened in the last decade, and it takes a couple of decades for this to kind of seep into popular culture and like kind of the consciousness of people. So it's a matter of time. Mm. But yeah, there's an industry here that I don't think is going away anytime soon, and, and you know, it's it's big enough where France is jealous. So Paris is trying very hard to catch up. Uh, Macron is trying very, you know, very hard to kind of replicate what London's kind of done organically over the last decade. Mm. All right. So in 2013, you, you saw a gap in the market for early stage funding in the UK specifically or, or UK and Europe? Pan Europe. Pan Europe. Yeah. Okay. We, we kind of thought kind of more, more broadly globally, but you can't do everything. So we, we were convinced that, you know, the means of distribution had changed that before, if you were in if you weren't really in the Bay Area, it was hard to scale. But when you had the App Store and you had Facebook and increasingly you had Google as a distribution channel, you could acquire customers from anywhere in the world. It really didn't make a difference where you were born or where you were headquartered. As long as you had a good product, those those distribution mechanisms really flattened and leveled the playing field. Mm -hmm. And we were convinced that, you know, you're in an economy that produces interesting stuff that has really talented people. Some of those people are going to go off and build companies. You know, the financial crisis really helped specifically in the UK, because if you're a graduate from Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial, like any of the Russell colleges, your path into tech was pretty limited because there weren't very many peers or graduates before you who you could look to as kind of the role model. But when the crisis happened, banking stopped paying. Banking became a lot less interesting. And so people were forced into this new industry, which isn't very new. And then all of a sudden there were examples of success. And the minute you see that someone who's two years, three years, four years, your senior 
is doing really well and having fun, you kind of want to do that. And they kind of like the, the path just gets a little bit more trodden. Um, so I'm not surprised, right? Go Cardless like was one of the first out of that, that younger batch of people who like went to YC, like young, young graduates from those colleges went to YC and then came back. And it's not surprising that Monzo was born out of the go card list, you know, and there's a duffel as a travel startup is a go card list alum. Hmm. You know, there are people who kind of peel off from those organizations and go off and build companies yeah. and then they do well. And that becomes very virtuous. And it's kind of what ends up happening. That's what the Bay Area has done for the last like 60 years. Hmm. There's no reason why the same thing wouldn't get replicated here in our in our mind. I think you invested in go card list. Yeah, we, maybe personally. Yeah, I was the first outside seed investor outside of YC. So wow. that they get money from YC and then they came to the UK and then I ended up introducing them to a bunch of my friends. And so together we were going to end up doing kind of their angel round and then they got interest from, from Axel and then from Passion and then they filled out the rest of the round. But we're still shareholders. All right. Or me personally shareholder. So now we're in 2020. Yeah. And time flies. So the gaps, I think, in, in the market have, to, to some extent, at least uh, filled in. Um, how, do you, how has your thesis evolved from, from 2013? Yeah, so, so our, our investment strategy was being, being one of these markets, broadly Europe, where if you just turned up, you would do well. Uh, and if you happen to have a little bit of knowledge, you would do a little bit better than well. And our, our argument was if you're well connected to California, to specifically Silicon Valley, and could kind of facilitate being a bridge between the two ecosystems, you could do incredibly well. Um, that market arbitrage, which is what it was, has largely closed at the early stage. Which uh, is what? Kind of invest early here and then rate, help companies raise larger rounds later. Be the bridge back yeah. to California, help them get partnerships, talent, maybe ultimately acquisitions, right? Be a facilitator between the two geographies. Um, and, and more than anything, write the check. There was a time in 2010, 2011, 2012, because if you, if you think about the history of the UK and the venture community, most of the people raised money at the top of the dot-com bubble, 1999, 1998, maybe 2000, maybe right after the bubble, 2001, and then the bubble burst. That money dried up because that market was so nascent. The money dried up even quickly, even more quickly. It was even higher beta than the U.S. would have been. Uh, so the, the the peak down was 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 even more volatile, which meant most of those businesses and those funds were kind of end of life. Ten years later, they weren't going to raise another fund, and so that created a vacuum in 2010, 2011, 2012, and. We were convinced that, you know, kind of post-financial crisis, there'd be more stuff. And then these distribution mechanisms all came into being like around 2008. So you, if, if you literally turned up, you would, you, and there'd be stuff to invest in. And if you were courageous enough to write the first check, some of that stuff would actually turn out to be interesting and big, which was kind of our investment thesis. And then if you could be a facilitator back, you could actually add some more value over and above that. So, but just turning up, I think, got you like 80% of the way. When we fundraised, I mean, apart from these big funds, Index and Axel, there were no small funds. Pro Founders was the first. Passion was then afterwards. We were, we were kind of number six in the queue across Europe because it took us a long time to raise our capital. Uh, we would have probably been number three if it didn't take us that long. Now there's like 125 of these guys. Wow. I mean, like everyone has a venture fund. And the challenge here is everyone has a venture fund willing to speculate, but with small checks. So turning up and writing a small check now doesn't gain you very much because lots of other people do it. So you now actually have to be kind of good at your job. But turning up at this Series B, like with a real size check, like a 10 million plus check, still gets you really far ahead of the game because no one writes there are only five funds in europe that raise 250 million plus a year that's it so and not every fund raises at the same time so maybe which funds are those so i have my little list so i'd say you know index axel so i don't know who the full list would be because not mm -hmm. every fund raises every single year so i would say like everyone's roughly on a three to four year cycle mm -hmm. so that means there's a universe of like 15 to 20 funds mm -hmm. at max and i i can think of 10 so index axel uh, Atomico, Lake Star, EQT, 
North Zone, Partech, um, what am I missing? You know, these are funds that are above 250, Holtzbrink, um, it starts thinning out. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the data now says 70% of all of Europe's Series B investments, like the 10 million plus type check, are done by American firms, which either means that the American firms are coming in and doing all these things, or no one's able to raise money. And the few people who are able to raise money are usually getting it from the American firms. And I think it's more the latter than, mm -hmm. the, than the former. And it's the reason why Sequoia is setting up an office in London, because Honestly, just turning up gets you 80% of the way there. Mm. It's kind of free money from that point on. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that. So it, it was tough to tell. I kind of read different versions of it. Um, maybe, it's a, maybe it's a UK office that they're opening. I don't know if they're looking to cover all of Europe from that office. Yeah. So, I mean, some of the stuff they've told us, and then I don't know how much is, but then some of it's ended up in the public domain. So the stuff that's ended up in the public domain is probably fine to share. So on average for the last year, for the last, you know, over the last 10 years per year, Sequoia spent about 20 partner days. So cumulatively across the organization, their partners have come over to Europe about 20 times uh, a year. That number last year jumped to 120. So they're spending a lot more time compared to historically. Now, obviously, they're in the U.S. the remaining 250 days of the year per person. So and there's more than one of them. So it's still a small fraction of the overall firm's kind of time. But you can see that the jump has been dramatic. They've also been really active. Benchmark has been really active here as well. That's another top. I mean, Sequoia and Benchmark probably would be the two firms at the top of the game in the U.S. Um, people see opportunity uh, and they're putting their capital to work. The valuations here are a little bit cheaper than the U.S. That's part of the reason, you know, Kleiner Perkins, which is a flagship venture fund in the U.S., has kind of lost its path a little bit over the last decade because they weren't as active as Sequoia or Benchmark would have been. But the brand name of Kleiner in Europe is equivalent to the brand name of Kleiner in the 90s in the Bay Area, whereas Kleiner now is some competition in the Bay Area. So they're finding it's actually really easy to win mm. deals here when they come over here. So they're spending more time. You know, so you're seeing more and more U.S. firms. I would say when, we, when you talk to other people in the industry here, there's at least one partner at one U.S. firm in Europe once a week. Yeah. So it's as much, correct me if I'm, if I'm misinterpreting your, your words, it's as much that there's just less competition for those deals in Europe uh, as it is for whatever reason people are seeing value in Europe or people are expecting some sort of, you know, coming boom in, in Europe, a, a geography that frankly has been you know, slower, uh, slower growth compared to the, the U.S. and other parts of the world over the last you know, couple of decades, maybe. Yeah, but the tech economy is not that correlated to the overall GDP growth. So the tech industry has grown up dramatically. The local money here is very few and far between. There are only five funds above 250. I mean, there's like tens of funds in the U.S. that are above 250. So again, if you turn up here, you'll win. And the market in the U.S. has become incredibly competitive because mm. like here in the seed state side, the U.S. market is filled in. Lots of people have venture funds right now. 7-Eleven, the, you know, the, the convenience store chain has a venture no fund. Uh, JetBlue Airways, a low cost airline carrier has a venture fund. I mean, you know, everyone wants to be in, in the <laughs> venture game. Um, and so there's more competition in the in, in the Bay Area. And so, you know, Europe has stuff, has very little competition. And then some of that stuff will become global. You, you should be an investor if you're if you're backing the, 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 the iconic businesses of mm -hmm. tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So so I think that your your initial thesis in 2013, apart from in, investor early, because there are a few people doing it, was that things like the App Store, Facebook were you know, basically providing like plat, you know, distribution platforms that allowed even very small companies in pretty much any geography to access a global market. And, uh, and some of your initial investments kind of picked up on that theme. Is that uh, still a lead leading driver of some of your investment thinking? Or are you seeing other kind of you know, more platform, more, more, more fundamental, more horizontal trends developing that are, that are impacting how you think about how you invest going forward? Yeah, I mean, so that, that trend is still there. You know, you wouldn't have seen a Rovio, like an Angry Birds, 
two decades ago. And, you know, so it's in a, a comparatively small town. It's right outside Helsinki, I think, you know, and they have a audience of a billion players. And, and that's all largely due to the fact that they sit on top of the app store and they don't have to worry about customer acquisition the same way as if they had to go find each user without the app store. And they still have to worry about customer acquisition. But it's just that the platform makes a big, big difference. Um, I think that's a platform that everyone now exploits. Um, so I think, you know, it's an arbitrage, but that arbitrage, again, like most arbitrages, gets arbed out. What we're starting to see now is a lot more people are running mixed development teams, like mixed country development teams. So the other big trend that we're seeing, and you see it in the U.S. as well, you know, there are companies which use a, a development center somewhere far away where the costs are much lower. And a good example of this would be Ring, which is the uh, camera doorbell for your house that Amazon bought for a billion. It's an L.A. company, but basically it's a Ukrainian company. Almost everything was done in Ukraine. And, and Ukraine's a really good poster child for this. Grammarly, which is a company that corrects your grammar and your spelling mistakes. It's a browser plugin, you know, is a is a billion dollar company sitting in Kiev um, with customers really predominantly not in Ukraine but in America. You, you wouldn't right. English language English, English language. language. I mean, I think they've they've gone global. I think they support French, et cetera. But you know, I think it's their their growth has largely been the U.S. market. You know, you you couldn't have seen those models executed two decades ago, and even a decade ago, there were very early days, and and you're going to see more and more of those. I think, and you know. It, part of its cost on the on on the U.S. side, and part of it is that the the, the world is flattened out. But is there another kind of mega trend that gets you eighty percent of the way there? Unfortunately, no. But the good news is that that the economy here, which is like when we were starting, we were struggling for logos to show people Europe could produce, and Skype was the logo, and Skype was kind of the only logo that people would recognize. Now you have a selection of logos, uh, you know, Deliveroo, Babylon, Darktrace, Monzo, Revolut, you know, Transfer. I mean, there's a bunch of these that people even in the U.S. will understand. So the market has gotten infinitely bigger here. It's now just being a good venture person is probably probably all you really need to, to, to be. Mm. So the market, help me, help me parse all this through because on the one hand um the the companies that were kind of the uh, funds like yours were were funding in in 2013 and you know the couple of years before and after that are you know, starting to bear fruit and probably all all the the successful uh, logos that you just named coming out of europe were kind of started more or less around that time so on on the one hand um in part, no doubt, skewed by you know, mainstream media coverage, it it feels like a lot of the most interesting stuff is now like Series C, Series D, you know, I don't know, pre-IPO uh, funding. Similarly, the business cycle has is obviously you know kind of he heated up, and you know, some would suggest that we're that we're nearing a peak. How do you think about where the most interesting opportunities are now? Uh, in early stage versus you know growth stage uh, you know, private versus public companies um, are, are you still as bullish on early stage right now given the environment and given the, the economic cycle as you as you were before yeah i mean i think they're they're both compelling uh i actually think later stage maybe not series b but kind of growth capital is actually quite tough um the cycles are much shorter, which is because you're coming in later into these businesses and they will grow. But the amount of money that goes in is also incredibly high. And what ends up happening whenever there's kind of more supply and there's less demand is prices go up. So prices of those companies goes up dramatically. And we've seen it in the public markets. There are a bunch of companies. I mean, Casper is probably the latest one in the mattress side, which is probably going to end up like flat to down from where its private market valuation was. Because the private markets are flooded with capital at, the, at those kinds of stages. The early stage, you know, there's no gimme anymore, but the fundamentals here are so much stronger, right? There was a, this was an economy where most people didn't go into the tech industry. It was very difficult to recruit people 10 years ago into the tech industry. Now people are actively, it's a very vibrant sector. And so when there's a vibrant sector, there's, there's, there are companies to be backed. And it's kind of irrespective of where you are in the business cycle. The business cycle will, amplify you and may end up slowing you down a little bit, but your absolute growth is usually going to be pretty high as a young company, regardless of the business cycle, because you're starting basically from nothing. And so 
we're still big, big, big believers in, in, in the early stage side. Um, you know, there's just a lot more stuff happening here. There are more talented people here that are doing this kind of stuff. So there's no shortage of opportunities um, to, to, to write a check yeah. into. So no shortage of opportunities. Plus, I feel like, uh, at least from an outsider standpoint, very early stage investing sounds complicated, right? Scary. You, you have few data points to go on. Um, you, you know, you can do all of your kind of, you know, th thumb, thumb twiddling and head, head scratching in, in your own time thinking about, you know, how the world's going to change and trends and whatever. But at the end of the day, whether you pick the company that is actually going to execute or not is, is kind of hard. Um, so in terms of, you know, your own, your own experience, you, you've been at this for, uh, what I guess as an investor, 10 plus years now, um, are, are there any heuristics that you've developed based on, you know, personal lessons or, or mistakes that you've made in the past that kind of help you, uh, I don't know, parse through these, these massive numbers of potential investment opportunities? Yeah. So we have a really simple heuristic. We write it down on our website because it's that simple, which is we basically back brand new markets. So we're big believers that when there's a brand new market, when something could not have been invented until very recently, our feeling is when it could have been invented previously, it probably would have been invented. And the reason why there isn't a flagship company in that space is probably because it's hard. When something has changed, there's it's, it's a greenfield opportunity. Everyone has equal opportunity to kind of do well. So we only write checks into brand new, brand new markets where it's not just a brand new company, but the market itself is nascent. Now, sometimes these things are harder to uncover. So, you know, Deliveroo, people don't think of it as a brand new market because this is a food delivery business, but you couldn't have done food delivery without, without apps on your phone to track the drivers and to make sure that the food was going from place A to place B and you were able to run that operational business pretty tightly. Monza wouldn't have been invented if the, regula the regulators hadn't changed the banking requirements and just brought down the capital requirements dramatically. We sadly didn't write the check into Monza. We should have. That was a pass for us. But, you know, that was a big fundamental change uh, in the market. So sometimes these, these changes may not look as dramatic to a new market, but there's a reason for the company creation. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's our heuristic. And then our biggest lesson... And this we unfortunately learned the hard way in, in Europe and, and in the UK is you have to write checks to people who are never going to need you. So there's a very natural inclination, particularly if you've been around this industry for a while and particularly if you've been working on the other side of the table inside of a tech company or inside of a startup that you offer something beyond your cash to the founder. And unfortunately, in Europe, the founder will come and ask you for advice. So you'll feel really engaged and pleased that, you know, you're, you're contributing in the U S they'd probably go to five or 10 other people and ask for that same piece of advice. Cause if you're a founder, you're not going to trust one person's judgment on any, any one issue. You're going to go kind of sample the market and you'll probably hear eight or nine out of the 10 kind of tell you exactly the same thing. Cause the formula for building these businesses and it's mostly common sense and it's experience and people kind of converge on the same stuff. In Europe, you'll go talk to five or 10 people and you'll get wildly different answers from the five or 10. So as the founder, you'll get pretty confused as to what to do. Do you listen to your investor? Do you listen to this person who's built a very successful business? And you may choose to listen to your investor. You may choose to listen to someone else. You may choose to do simply nothing. And you find that it's impossible to be an advisor or a coach to your companies. So you end up having to pick companies that are going to succeed. And we, we literally write this into our investment memos. You know, if we were hit by a bus tomorrow, what would happen to this company? And if there's any dependency whatsoever on us being someone involved in the company, it's probably not for us because we just can't take that kind of risk mm -hmm. uh, in, in the UK. And you end up picking, you basically train yourself to, pick things that are going to survive with or without you, mm. which means you're picking slightly more resilient companies. Um, and again, if these markets are interesting and big, smart people will kind of figure their way out. Now that said, you write that into the memo, you pick on that basis, you know, you're on your phone and on WhatsApp, on messenger with your companies all the darn time. So you're not passive in that sense, but you're picking on the basis that you're going to be passive. Mm. And we had to learn that the hard way. We tried a few times to help, and it never, it always backfired mm -hmm. uh, on us. Um, so we just gave up. Yeah. 
you mentioned you passed on Monzo early on. Um, familiar with one other um, bank startup that, that you guys uh, haven't invested in, had the opportunity to, but didn't invest in. Is there anything specific about either new banks or fintechs in general that make it difficult uh, or unlikely that you guys will uh, will get involved? Yeah, so so Monzo, and we spent quite a bit of cycles with Tom because at the time Tom was at Starling and he was fundraising for Starling and then there was a split between Ann and pretty much everyone else. Uh, and so Tom sheepishly called us up and saying, we're going to form a new company and the time is Mondo, not even Monzo. So this is like super early days. Now, we knew that the banking requirements changed. Our, our big two reasons, and, and in hindsight, they're kind of dumb reasons, but the, the thought process that we went through was we thought the banking regulations were very UK specific, and we weren't convinced you could build a really interesting big business, even though banks get pretty big in the UK. And we had a big disagreement between the two of us in kind of the partnership that you would be able to build a large, a large enough, valuable enough company just focusing on the UK. Uh, you know, I think the answer to that is you probably can. Uh, so we kind of miscalled that one. And then the second one, which is we had a long conversation with Tom about how they would do customer acquisition. And all the answers we got were really generic, which is we're going to run some campaigns. We're going to you know, do some marketing. I was like, give me... Build a cool brand and people love us. Yeah, so they didn't, they didn't quite say that, but that would have been... That would have been a better answer than the generic answers we got. Um, and, you know, if you're writing, you know, conceptually in that kind of world, you know, you, you realize what the change has been, which is the capital requirements are down. And the next big question is, like, how are you going to get customers, right? And you kind of give the company a pass on, like, yeah, they'll be able to build a banking system. The guys are brilliant. You know, there's a lot of plumbing involved, but it's not that hard. You could understand and wrap your arms around that stuff. Um, you can't figure out how you're going to get customers. And really what ended up happening is they built a particular color, they built a cool brand, and it's like the brand for the millennials in this space, and they kind of grew organically from there. To be fair, I don't think they knew, I mean, kind of maybe they intuitively knew that, but they didn't really know the formula. But the answers we got were so generic at the time. The, the challenge in our industry is this is largely a stock picking game, and you don't know where these companies are going to go. And it's their call options uh, more than anything else. So they could explode and turn out to be very valuable. The worst case is you just lose the value of the option. It would have cost us a million quid. We should have written a million pound ticket mm. to find out what we knew and what we didn't know. You know, uh, losing a million quid is not the end of the world out of a fund. And you don't really know the answer to this. And we knew the guys were brilliant. But, yeah, we didn't converge on that uh, quite right. Uh, and so we, we ended up not doing it. And... You know, I still, I still don't know where Monza is going to go, and the growth has been exceptional. And to be fair, I don't know if it really matters that I don't know what I don't know. We should have just been in, involved, uh, and you learn a lot by being involved in this industry. So that's that's the other the other negative. Uh, it is is the capital intensiveness of of a bank or many other types of fintechs? Is that is that a concern or, or part of the that was the, a, that was a part of the, that was part of the scariness yeah. and again you don't know and back then I think it was like 2017 when Monzo was starting you you didn't know that there was going to be this flood of capital that came into the private markets that would kind of sustain the growth I mean to be fair we could have said the same thing about Deliveroo and you know Deliveroo's had no problems raising capital over the years you you kind of need to I mean our biggest lesson is you kind of need to write the check when something is interesting enough in a new market because. The harm is you lose your money, and the upside is 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 kind of infinite. So it's so asymmetric the payoffs that you you, you should have the option on your side. Yeah. So I mentioned in in opening that I was really looking forward to connecting with you specifically because of how how thoughtful a, a guy you are. Um, we've we've seen all sorts of uh, interesting developments uh, uh, from a social and political standpoint re recently, really worldwide. You know populist waves and uh you know tech backlash and and, and all the rest um what are what are some of the most kind of pressing challenges in in your mind uh that you know that, that we as as a broader society need to be dealing with to, to the extent that they're you know related with tech or or not I mean, to the extent that we all believe that history kind of repeats itself and we're in kind of the same cycles 
Yeah, there are parallels to the 20s, 30s, and then what happened in the 40s, right? Where you have a great degree of wealth, right? You have a gilded age. You have a bunch of folks who end up benefiting from that wealth. And I think you benefit from the wealth even more so today because I don't think returns accrue to labor. I think they accrue to capital, um, except maybe in the tech industry, they accrue to labor because labor is a shareholder in the capital base. Uh, it's one of the few places in the world where employees have a bunch of stock uh, in their own companies. You know, and the scale of these companies means that you don't need the same level of people, same size of population. So you, the benefits don't really accrue to a very wide base. They accrue to a small group of shareholders. Dropbox is not a very big company. Monzo is not a very big company in terms of people relative so, to something like HSBC. So if these things turn out to be huge value creators, the wealth doesn't flow across the world or across a wide set. So you, you end up with pronounced income inequality. And then at the same time, you have this kind of tide of nationalism, you know, far rightism across the world, which is kind of what you saw in the 30s. Um, it's kind of a natural reaction to this, uh, and it kind of plays and interplays with, with the rest of the world. And, and I think we still have a very immature industry in terms of responsibility and in terms of the tech leadership community to figure out how to deal with this stuff. So, you know, you can bury your head in the sand and say, this has nothing to do with me and I'm just like a platform, which is I think largely the view that Facebook has taken. Or you can try and figure out some mechanism to police it, which means you're probably gonna screw up in lots of different ways, which is I think one of the reasons why Facebook doesn't wanna touch it. Um, But you kind of know that it's happening around you. So you've got to confront it. And if you don't confront it, either it boils up to something or there's confrontation or the government step in to confront it, neither of which I think are particularly good outcomes uh, for a bunch of reasons. Um, Because I think the government will kill the the goose and confrontation if it boils down to some kind of escalation of violence or kind of the stuff that you're seeing in India with the, you know, the Hindu Nationalist Party persecuting, you know, a seventh of its population. You know, you know, these things are not these things are going to end up in in some kind of crisis. And and we don't know where the crisis is going to be, but it can be pretty bad. And I, I think as an industry, we're just. We're still in, we're such a young industry that we haven't figured out how to take like civic responsibility and take our roles and responsibilities in the creation of these things very seriously. Um, we're going to have to grow up um, and we're going to have to grow up really quickly. Uh, otherwise, these things will spiral out of control. And that's kind of what happened with World War One and World War Two. And, you know, hopefully we don't end up in any kind of conflict that way. But you can see why some of these things stress and fracture the society in a way where you you end up leading to conflict i mean i guess there are some self-preservation considerations right there there is in a certain sense a financial incentive for the industry to not letting these problems spiral spiral out of control because as you say then it leads to you know maybe over regulation or it leads to broader international issues slow growth which you know prevent uh prevent further creation of, of value but but no specific actor appears to be doing much yet. I mean, is is there a kind of rational path that, that you see? I don't know either kind of investment community or tech community more broadly starting to to follow to to at least get the ball rolling on some of these things. Well, I mean, there's conversation, but I don't think the tech community is necessarily aligned. There's some folks who are big believers in solving income inequality and doing it through things like universal basic income. There are other people who are deep skeptics. Um, so I don't think as an industry we've figured it out. And then everyone works in their own economic self-interest. And the problem with this is that's when you see real pronounced problems, because if everyone just works in their small domain, preserving preserving their own kind of upside, you don't you, you sometimes get like you get local maxima, not like global maxima, and you know, everyone suffers and uh, we gotta figure this stuff out. Nah, I, I don't know how we're gonna do it, but I I don't think it's a particularly good idea when 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 in, when income I mean, income inequality like the middle class in the U.S. and the middle class in the U.K. has a lot less wealth than it ever did, especially when you adjust it for inflation than than ever before. And wealth on the top one percent or the top three percent or the top five percent is growing at like all time highs. This is this is not sustainable. Uh, you know, I get it. Everyone on the bottom is being lifted up and the quality of life for the poor is dramatically better than it was, you know, 20, 50 years ago. But 
human society is not used to dealing with that kind of extremes uh, in, in terms of wealth. And it is visible. Um, and the more visible it is, the more of a backlash there's kind of there, there's, there's going to be created. Um, you know, we've got to figure this stuff out. Uh, but they're not easy answers. And I don't think we talk about this stuff very much as an industry yeah. either. Yeah. So that's probably where it starts. Yeah. This is a huge conversation and, and one we could pick up on a separate episode, I'm sure. Uh, we should probably wrap it up for today. Yeah. Hussein Kanji, thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in to Rebank. If you like today's show, reach out. Follow us on Twitter at Rebank Podcast and join the conversation. For more on banking, fintech, and the future, check out our regular content at www.bankingthefuture.com.